Okay, I want to welcome you all here to our discussion today, uh, which is entitled Managing Diabetes. My name is Leslie Lawton, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I am a registered dietitian and a diabetes educator at the Mind Body Wellness Center. And I do welcome questions during our discussion today, but since we are currently in a recorded format, I'm going to invite those questions at the end of our discussion. Uh, as far as what you can expect throughout the course of our discussion today, I'm hopeful that you are comfortable defining what diabetes is in basic terms, that you are able to identify modifiable versus non-modifiable risk factors of diabetes, that you feel comfortable talking about different ways to manage diabetes, and last but not least, you have resources available to help you or a loved one manage your diabetes as well. So I think it helps to start by looking at what diabetes actually is, uh, as far as other things that we're going to talk about today and layer upon that. And when you look at what's going in, on in diabetes, we basically have two potentially different are areas of uh, concern. One is perhaps we're not making as much insulin as we had been making in the past. The other is perhaps uh, we're not our body isn't as aware of the insulin as we had been making in the past. And insulin, for, for those of you who aren't aware, is really important. That's a problem if we are resistant to our insulin or if we don't have enough insulin because it is what is responsible, maybe intuitively, this would come to you, for getting the sugar that comes from the food we eat and travels around in our bloodstream. Insulin is responsible for getting that sugar out of our bloodstream and into our cells where that energy needs to go. So you can see why these two scenarios might be a problem as far as they relate to diabetes. Okay, so this slide is looking at the actual evolution of diabetes and it's just helping to illustrate that for the discussion we're having today with respect to type 2 diabetes, you can see that type 2 diabetes is kind of like osteoporosis in that it is a progressive situation. Generally, people don't just wake up with type 2 diabetes. You can see that over time, because of things like genetics or changes in our activity level and our weight um, or our age, that a person might first develop prediabetes um, and then potentially develop uh, type 2 diabetes. So it's just looking at the progressive uh, nature of diabetes. This particular slide is helping for those of you who might not be comfortable with how diabetes is actually diagnosed. Uh, and when you look here, you can see that fasting glucose, so after I've fasted for 12, maybe 9 to 12 hours, um, uh, a, a quote, within target glucose level would be less than 100. And then pre-diabetes would be uh, greater than 100, so it would be about 100 to 125. And once you get to greater than or equal to 126, that can be the point at which the diagnosis of diabetes might be made. And generally, healthcare providers don't want just one fasting glucose. They might want repeated fasting glucose to make a diagnosis, or they might want to actually get your A1C as well. And I'm just going to talk about the numbers here. In a moment, I'll talk about what A1C actually measures. But as far as what we're trying to look for in terms of diagnosis, an A1C less than 5.7 would be normal. Once you get to a 5.7 to 6.4, you might be in that pre-diabetes category. You have a little bit more sugar in your bloodstream than, than perhaps is normal. And then diabetes is greater than or equal to 6.5. That's at what point the diagnosis of diabetes might be made. So when you look at how blood sugars a person might monitor on their meter tie to those numbers we were just talking about, it's a little different. So we were just talking about diagnostic criteria. What are you actually looking for on a meter? I get this question all the time. I feel like people are really uh, confused and uncertain about what they're trying to look for on a meter. So generally, when you check before meals, we'd be looking for somewhere between 70 and 130. And then if you were to check two hours after meals, that's another opportunity to check your glucose levels, we'd be looking for 180. And that's based on the more liberal targets, so you might hear different targets that are stricter depending on what guidelines your doctor adheres to. The other question I get is, well, how does this pertain to normal glucose levels? Like, how high are these numbers even though they're at these target ranges? Well, when you look at non-diabetes, 
around 70 to 100 is a reasonable um, target level for glucose. And then after meals, typically a person isn't ever going to rise over 140 if diabetes isn't present. So that just kind of shows the difference between um, maybe what you're shooting for with a diagnosis of diabetes and what you're shooting for or what it would look like if a person didn't have diabetes, okay? But the other point I want to illustrate is that they're actually pretty close to one another. So in essence, what we're trying to do is keep those glucose levels as near normal as possible. Okay, this is a maybe helpful slide for illustrating a little bit more detail as to that A1C that we had talked about before. And so some people call it a hemoglobin A1C, some people call it an A1C, but uh, you might be able to easily remember what an A1C is uh, when you think about a cornflake versus a frosted flake. What an A1C is looking at is how frosted your red blood cells are. And when you look at a frosted flake, you can see the amount of sugar that's actually attached to the frosted flake. So what an A1C is looking at using that as a comparison is the frosting, if you will, that's attached to your red blood cells. And so when you, when you look at this analogy, your, your red blood cells are circulating in your bloodstream with your sugar in your bloodstream. And so it makes sense that if you have a lot more sugar in your bloodstream, your red blood cells are going to get coated with more of that sugar. So literally what your doctor is looking at is the percentage of your red blood cells that are covered in sugar. That's kind of a good way to think about an A1C. And guess what? Your doctor can retest it every three months because your red blood cells only live for three months. So your doctor is able to retest this because you've had enough turnover and if you've lowered the amount of sugar in your bloodstream that your red blood cells that aren't as coated in sugar should now reflect a lower A1C. Okay, so that's just kind of a little overview of that particular piece of lab work. So why are we so concerned about blood sugar levels? Why does it even matter? This particular slide is addressing that element. I won't go through every single part of the body that's identified here as a place where complications can occur, but what I will say is that every part of your body that's subjected to blood, which is pretty much you know, all parts of your body, um, are potentially at risk of complications if those glucose levels aren't within our target ranges. And so that's what this slide is really trying to illustrate. Now, that might not sound very positive, but the positive side of it happens to be that if we can keep your glucose levels within those target ranges, we're protecting your body from these potential complications. So complications are not something, diabetes-related complications are not something that has to happen and that can actually largely be prevented by how we manage our blood sugar levels. Okay, so a little bit of information about the non-modifiable risk factors uh, that can, can lead to diabetes. A lot of people are, are wondering when they're in my office, geez, how did I get here? How did this, why, why me? How did this happen? Well, our genetics. Um, we, we can't modify our genetics and obviously that could contribute to the potential development of diabetes. Um, another risk factor is our age. And I will tell you that being over the age of 40 is a risk factor for having diabetes or developing diabetes. Though I will say that many of our children are developing type 2 diabetes nowadays compared to many, many years in the past. And that has to do with some of our modifiable risk factors that we'll be talking about here in the future. But you'll also maybe already be aware that we don't call type 1 diabetes, juvenile onset diabetes, and we don't call type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes anymore because our children are developing type 2 diabetes. It doesn't make sense to call an 8-year-old who may have developed type 2 diabetes a person who has adult onset It just doesn't work, you know. So um, some of our non-modifiable risk factors certainly can contribute, but again, some of our modifiable risk factors are contributing to patterns that we're seeing. Okay, so family history, this again ties to the genetics component that we were talking about before. And ethnicity, again, we're looking at the potential for genetics to influence our development of diabetes. And you can see that certain um, people of ethnic backgrounds like Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, African Americans, Asian Americans might have an increased risk for developing diabetes. Again, looking at that genetics potential. Uh, and our medical history. So uh, gestational diabetes could signal a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life. Uh, women who are dealing with polycystic ovary syndrome 
uh, have a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And your birth weight as a baby could determine a potential risk factor for developing diabetes. So you can see if you were born over nine pounds, that could influence a higher risk of you developing diabetes. Same thing with being born exceptionally small. If you were born less than five and a half pounds, you might have a higher risk of developing diabetes. And finally, if you have prediabetes, clearly that could indicate or signal the potential of developing type two diabetes. Okay. So what about all the stuff that we do have the potential to change that could make an impact on our risk of developing diabetes? Well, two uh, that are coming to light are certainly our weight uh, and also our activity level. Uh, when we break those down a little bit further, <clears throat> you can see that on this slide, um, if we have extra weight, then that can contribute to our insulin resistance which was one of those two problems we were talking about um, when we talked about what is actually going on with type 2 diabetes. And so I guess the, the basic way to say it is if, say, I have 20 extra pounds of tissue, 20 extra pounds of weight, and I can influence that, then I can change how insulin resistant I am um, because I don't have to distribute insulin to that 20 pounds of extra tissue. So I've, I've kind of lightened what my pancreas has to do in terms of making insulin. So absolutely, uh, weight can change our risk of developing diabetes. It can also change how we are able to manage our diabetes. I've seen people change their weight and maybe they don't need to rely as heavily on a medication, if at all, that medication anymore because just changing the 20 pounds of tissue that they changed changed what that medication did or didn't need to do for them to help them manage their diabetes. So as far as activity is concerned, our little couch potatoes are just helping to illustrate that this also plays into the insulin resistance piece of diabetes that we were talking about before. And you can see that this, again, is something that can influence our insulin resistance. And if you or a loved one is dealing with diabetes, I always encourage people to consider, if you have a meter, uh, if you ever have a high blood sugar level, uh, and, and then if you can get some activity in, and then you can recheck your blood sugar after you've come in from that activity, it's amazing how powerful activity can be. It can lower your blood sugar by 50 to 100 points right then and there in the moment, and that's so powerful. The nice thing about activity is that it has implications for lowering our glucose levels beyond just that, that, that before and after that we talked about. It has the potential to create lower insulin resistance for hours after you've done the activity. So activity really is very, very powerful. Um, but on those two points, that unfortunately is why some of our kids are you know, developing type two diabetes nowadays because they aren't as active as kids maybe used to be in the past and, and possibly they are heavier than our kids um, used to be in the past. So as far as nutrition is concerned, uh, this obviously can play into being able to manage diabetes. And all of you may have seen this plate before in the past. This is just helping to give a basic guideline for ways to manipulate your glucose levels. And I'm gonna focus on the different elements of the plate because uh, different parts of this plate can have different effects on our glucose levels. So I'm just gonna try to break that down a little bit further. But I will tell you that in all general terms, we are trying to make half of our plate made of, I'm gonna call it rabbit food, unstarchy vegetables is another way to put it. Uh, we're, this person's trying to make a quarter of their plate devoted to starchy foods like rice or pasta or peas. And then another quarter of the plate you can see is broken down and reserved for protein containing foods. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about each of those different elements uh, and tie it all back together. <clears throat> so carbohydrates. Um, most people are pretty familiar with carbohydrates because of Atkins diet or South Beach or any number of you know things that have come into light lately but what I can tell you is that carbohydrates are turned into sugar in in our bloodstream and that does not mean that we don't need them uh, and it does not mean that if I have diabetes I shouldn't be eating carbohydrates but what it does mean is that any of these things that you see listed up here or pictured up here at the top um, they do have carbohydrates and avoiding eating them in excessive quantities can help avoid too much sugar from pooling in our, our, our bloodstream. 
Because again, these foods are turned into sugar. Does not mean we have to avoid them though. Also, if we eat uh, more food than we need that has carbohydrates, clearly that can tie to a higher weight, which like we talked about before, can influence our management of our diabetes. One of the questions that came up in our last session was, well, is sugar you know, the same as you know, carbohydrates or those? Sugar is carbohydrates. Um, milk, because of the milk sugar in it has carbohydrates. Fruit has carbohydrates because of the fructose, the fruit sugar. And so do your starchy foods like potatoes and corn and um, peas and bread and pastas and rice. But again, the, the goal is not to omit them all together, but just to avoid excessive amounts of them to help manage glucose levels. Okay, so when we look at this person's plate, they have about three servings of carbohydrate-containing foods at the plate. They have a little potato, maybe the size of a computer mouse. They have peaches, about a half a cup of peaches in light syrup, and then they have eight ounces of milk. So what this is helping to illustrate is that this particular person has about three carbohydrate servings at a meal, and that's completely reasonable. What you as an individual need uh, depends on if you're maybe six foot two and a marathon runner, or if you're four foot 11 and you're, you, you have a very sedentary job. So this is kind of a middle of the road estimation of what a person might need, but it's very individualized. And it also depends on what your glucose levels do in response to the carbohydrates that a person might eat at a meal, okay? So moving on to facts. That was another small component of that plate. Uh, but I will say that if you feel like you have had enough information today, carbohydrates are a good starting point. This is more secondary information at this point in time. What I can tell you about fats is that if we consume fats in excessive quantities, um, they can cause insulin resistance because they could contribute to insulin blindness. Uh, and you know, it doesn't mean that we should avoid fats altogether at our meals, but this is why trying to stick to moderate amounts of fats at our meals can be helpful because they can indirectly raise glucose levels. Again, nowhere near the impact that carbohydrates can have, but they could have a slight impact on our glucose levels. And quite frankly, fats are helpful for absorbing fat-soluble vitamins. So they can help us to nourish our bodies. They can make our meals more satisfying. The point is excessive amounts of them, that could potentially be a problem. Fats how much would okay. be a theoretical reasonable amount. Well, maybe this person would put a tablespoon of salad dressing on their salad and perhaps a teaspoon of uh, butter uh, on their potato. And that's not at all an unreasonable amount of fats. That's a couple fat servings. And again, your unique individual needs vary depending on your activity level and so on and so forth. So this is again, a, kind of a, just a generic look at what this theoretical scenario could be and protein. Um, this is a, a food that exists, uh, a food, this is a macronutrient that exists in our food that can be helpful at regulating glucose levels in that when you pair carbohydrates with protein, so if I have a wrap like you have in front of you for lunch today perhaps, uh, so my starch, my carbs might be the uh, tortilla or the flat out that I you know, would put my lunch uh, meat, like my tuna in, the tuna would be my protein. Pairing carbs with protein can be really powerful at helping with what your blood sugar levels do two hours after you eat. So one thing that we're always advocating for, assuming it works for an individual, they can make it happen, is having protein along with your carbohydrates because it can change how much your blood sugars rise at the point at which your blood sugars would probably rise the most two hours after you eat a meal. So that can be a really, really helpful tool to get started for people who are already very reasonable about their carbohydrates, but now they want to do something else to change their glucose levels. So that's why protein is on this plate, because it paired along with your carbs can definitely help to not only make you feel more full and satisfied, but also to delay the rise and fall in your glucose levels. And if you're looking for approximate volumes for how much of each of these things I want to put on my plate, this slide is meant to help illustrate that. So if I'm trying to make half of my plate uh, rabbit food or unstarchy vegetables, that would be basically my, my two open hands worth of vegetables. And again, they are very low in carbohydrates. They give me an opportunity to feel like I'm full and satisfied 
perhaps when I'm trying to cut back on my carbohydrate intake. When you look at your starch, typically we might be shooting for smaller than the amount of the fist of my hand or maybe a tennis ball. Okay, and that again depends on the individual as far as what we're trying to look for at a meal. Um, when you look at protein, if you can judge the size of the palm of your hand pretty accurately, that's about how much protein you would be talking about. And when you talk about fat servings, that's maybe a tip of your thumb to two tips of your thumb worth of fat at a meal. So that's just kind of another visual to help guide and illustrate what we might be looking for. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about medications. But what I will say is that in the next several slides, uh, we have learned so much about diabetes in, in the recent past that there are any number of medications that are potentially uh, working with different parts of your body uh, to help manage you know, diabetes. And you can see that as far as those different areas, we are looking at our pancreas, our liver. There are some medications that can help our liver not to spill out extra sugar. Uh, there are medications that can help to replenish a gut hormone that we might be lacking in diabetes, which can in turn help to regulate our glucose levels. There are some medications that can help to regulate glucose uh, reabsorption from our kidneys as far as helping to control your glucose levels. And then, of course, there's insulin, which can help to manage uh, glucose levels. So in addition to our lifestyle, sometimes lifestyle may not be enough if you're physically not able to make enough insulin. And so there's a lot of medications that can help us to manipulate our glucose levels as well. And the last but not least thing I wanna leave you with is we just talked about an awful lot of information as far as managing diabetes is concerned. And it can be quite overwhelming. But the good news is that there are lots of resources available. Um, one thing that I don't recommend for a lot of people is turning into the food police because in a lot of instances, unless somebody says, I want you to police everything I eat, that may not be the most helpful thing for them. Uh, as far as things that could potentially be helpful, well, ask that person, what would be helpful for you, for me to, to help, you know, with you managing your diabetes? We do have life coaches available through Interactive Health as employees of Meadville Medical Center. And I believe if you carry the hospital insurance and you have um, the Highmark plan, they have health coaches available through that avenue as well. So there are people who can uh, reach out to you telephonically to help you with managing chronic health issues. Um, we also, of course, have the Mind Body Wellness Center where we have dietitians and diabetes educators on site uh, to help manage glucose levels, to help manage diabetes for people as well in both individual and group formats. And that is covered uh, by insurance. That is, that is a benefit that insurance has made available to pretty much everybody out there with diabetes because insurance companies do recognize that if a person feels comfortable managing their condition, then they're probably going to have less complications, less costs associated with their, their health. Uh, and then of course there's apps. If you like to use apps, there's Oh, there's food trackers like MyFitnessPal or Lose It or My Glucose Buddy to help you manage your glucose levels. There's all kinds of apps out there. Um, and there's accelerometers. If you're trying to get your activity level higher, uh, those can help you to assess where is your activity right now and where can you take it so it gets to the next level perhaps. Where are your opportunities? Maybe somebody who could be a buddy of yours. I call them an accountability buddy. Somebody who can be out there with you at 5.30 in the morning going for your walk so you're getting that activity in. Because oftentimes we do well when we have somebody else to help us with our accountability. Sometimes we can talk ourselves out of maybe what we're trying to achieve. And last but not least, I hope that after our discussion today, you feel a little bit more comfortable with you know, what diabetes actually happens to be and also you know, what are some ways to, to navigate it and manage it? Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. If you want to reach me, I'm at 814-333-373-2093. And I'm also available through the uh, hospital email at lawton at mmchs.org. Thank you again. I appreciate your time.